the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia the diamonds the one diamond harold brooke had a watchmaker's glass fitted in his eye through it he was intently regarding something which he held in his hand one of the two finest diamonds which ever came out of africa gone wrong i wonder what fungst will say he moved to the window under the stronger light he renewed his examination of the crystal through the little microscopic lens it'll be an affair of perhaps half an hour i've known it happen in less tyrrell shall have it he laughed <laughs> hard on tyrrell but harder still on me he and i will share the loss i wonder what fungst will say according to him we had captured two of the finest diamonds africa had ever yet produced they were to make our fortunes <laughs> well tyrrell shall have a chance of making his i wonder how far his knowledge of this sort of thing may go a few minutes afterwards a hansom dashed up in front of a quaint little shop in the neighbourhood of st john's square clerkenwell mr brooke sprang out and entered the shop a young man was its only occupant tyrrell i've brought you the diamond the young man behind the counter gave a perceptible start i've changed my mind you shall have it cheap cheap dirt cheap you shall have it for a thousand pounds a thousand pounds yes a thousand pounds but it must be money down i leave england to-night there are reasons which compel me i don't know when i may return is it a bargain here is the stone mr tyrrell took it with a hand which trembled he gave just one glance at it his eyes gleamed will a cheque do an open cheque mr tyrrell wrote an open cheque for a thousand pounds he handed it to mr brooke with a mere thanks that gentleman passed from the shop sprang into the hansom and was driven away mr tyrrell stared after him amazed i wonder what's up now he picked up his purchase from where he had placed it on the counter his hand still trembled he went from the shop into an inner room mary i've bought the diamond a note of exultation was in his voice a young woman was leaving the room a pile of linen in her arms at the sound of her husband's voice she turned mr brooks diamond mr brooks what do you think i gave for it a thousand pounds a thousand pounds i think that brooks gone mad he might have got ten times the sum from almost any one he says that he has had a sudden call abroad and wants the cash it's his affair not mine anyhow i've bought the diamond i gave him what he asked for it here it is mrs tyrrell laid her pile of linen on the table she took the stone which her husband held out to her she selected a watchmaker's glass from among several which were on the mantel shelf fitting it into her eye she examined the stone under the light of the window what a beauty she drew it closer to her eye what a beautiful stone she turned it over and over in her hand what is this speck of light right in the very heart of it what speck of light mr tyrrell selected a glass on his own account in his turn he examined the stone hardly had he fitted the glass in its place when he gave an exclamation he went nearer to the window give me a higher power she chose another glass from those upon the shelf she noticed that her husband's face had all at once turned pale what is the matter he made no immediate answer but no sooner had he begun to examine his purchase with the lens of higher power than he staggered back against the wall he took the glass out of his eye he looked round the room like a man who had received a sudden shock all his animation of a moment before had disappeared he's he's ruined me the thief i understand it now why he wanted the cash his haste and the call abroad oh what a fool i was i had seen the stone so often 
i thought i knew it so well that i never thought of looking at it i snapped him i thought he'd change his mind and he snapped me his wife advanced to him james what is wrong isn't it the stone you thought it was he laid his hand lightly on her arm hush there's someone in the shop see who it is she peeped through the curtain which screened the door it's mr hart what does he want with his handkerchief mr tyrrell mopped his brow i'll i'll go and see in the shop there was a tall portly gentleman his overcoat which was unbuttoned was lined and trimmed with fur about him there was an odour of wealth how do tyrrell how do mrs hart's going to be presented at the first drawing-room sheriff's wife and that sort of thing you know and i want to give her something neat in diamonds thought i'd give you a turn get them in the rough knew your father he and i have had many a deal together got anything good just now mr tyrrell looked round and round the shop he glanced behind him at the door which led into the inner room he drew a long breath i i happen to have one of the finest stones in england mr hart dare say there are a good many of the finest stones in england about just now and you want one of the finest prices in england for it too you are yourself something of a judge of diamonds i am something here is the stone examine it for yourself mr tyrrell handed the stone to mr hart as he did so it was to be noticed that his hand still trembled he mopped his brow as his visitor turned the stone over and over in his hands his lips seemed parched mr hart took the stone to the door got a glass he asked mr tyrrell hunted out a spy-glass he seemed to have some difficulty in finding one mr hart fitted it into his eye not a very strong glass this one of yours i've seen stronger but it's good enough to enable me to see that this is something like a diamond what's the figure mr tyrrell moistened his lips two thousand pounds too much it's dirt cheap mr hart i've seen worse stones than that sold for ten thousand pounds but i happen to be very much in want of ready cash i don't deny that the stone's a good one but it's in the rough and it may cut up rough and two thousand pounds is more than i care to pay for an ornament for a drawing-room even though that drawing-room be her majesty's but i'll tell you what i'll do as i knew your father i'll give you a cheque for fifteen hundred down upon the nail again mr tyrrell moistened his lips i'll accept it a cheque changed hands almost as expeditiously as the one for a smaller amount had changed hands only a few minutes before mr hart departed with his purchase i think i've scored that trick if this diamond isn't worth fifteen hundred pounds and a bit more why then i'm wrong mr hart then and there took a cab to the bond street headquarters of those famous jewellers messiahs ruby and golden he was shown into the senior partner's private room i want you to set this stone for me mr ruby took very gingerly between his finger and his thumb the piece of crystal which mr hart was holding out to him on the palm of his outstretched hand a diamond i see and uncut rather a fine specimen mr ruby's eyes glistened may i ask in confidence from whom you obtained it from a friend in the trade mr hart kept his eyes fixed upon the jeweller's face his tone was dry you don't happen to know i suppose if he has any more like this to dispose of can't say that i do what's it worth you see mr hart the value of a diamond depends upon so many things to us it depends in a measure on whether we have a customer who at the moment requires just such a stone and you have such a customer i see well i bought it for my wife i want you to cut it and mount it as a pin for the hair mr ruby hesitated he turned the jewel over and over in his hand we are old friends mr hart 
may i ask how much you gave for this two thousand pounds it was true that mr tyrrell had asked two thousand mr hart had probably forgotten that he had beaten him down to fifteen hundred two thousand pounds you are a man of business mr hart i dare say you have no objection to making a little profit even out of a diamond i will be frank with you we happen to have a valuable customer who is particularly in want of just such a stone as this it is on that account that i venture even in mr golden's absence to offer you for your two thousand pound purchase three thousand pounds a clear profit of a thousand pounds a thousand pounds mr hart stroked his chin my dear sir i am not reduced to selling my wife's diamonds has mrs hart yet seen the stone not yet she hasn't i bought it not half an hour ago then the thing is simplified i will carry my offer farther i will give you three thousand pounds for the stone and will allow you to select in addition any articles from our stock to the cash value of a thousand pounds the corners of mr hart's lips twitched he smiled it's a deal it was mr hart left the bond street establishment with a cheque for three thousand pounds in his pocket and in a red morocco case a set of very pretty diamond ornaments for a lady's hair the stone which he had purchased from mr tyrrell he left behind mr hart thinks himself a shrewd man mr ruby told himself when that gentleman had gone but he is not quite so shrewd as he thinks this is the very stone the duke is looking for unless i am mistaken he will give us for it rather more than four thousand pounds about an hour after mr golden entered mr ruby's room the senior partner rubbed his hands as the junior entered i have been indulging in a little deal while you have been out a little deal in diamonds the junior partner glanced sharply at the senior in appearance mr ruby was very different from mr golden mr ruby was large and florid mr golden was slight and dark with keen bright eyes i have lighted on the very stone we have been trying to find for the duke and i have bought it on the nail out and out the deuce you have what did you give for it three thousand in cash and a thousand in stock let me look at it mr golden held out his hand mr ruby produced a stone from the inner recesses of a large safe in a corner of the room mr golden took it to the window he examined it minutely for some moments with his naked eye then taking a spyglass from his waistcoat pocket he examined it through that scarcely had he placed the glass in its place than he sprang round at mr ruby ruby strong words seemed trembling on his lips if that were so he exercised an effort of self-control you've been done mr golden how many times have i asked you not to buy diamonds in my absence mr ruby's face was pasty hued but but it's one of the finest diamonds i've ever seen mr golden's glance was expressive of the most supreme contempt look at it through that and tell me if you see nothing mr ruby looked at the diamond through his partner's spyglass i i can only see that it is a very beautiful stone can't you see right in the centre what looks like a speck of light now that i look into it closely there certainly does seem to be something of the kind but it is so slight that even with this strong glass it is scarcely noticeable and yet sooner or later it will shiver that stone to splinters mr golden i have seen it before and i know what it is it is a sort of disease to which african diamonds are peculiarly liable especially the finest stones i wish to goodness ruby that you would leave these things to me 
that speck of light is a crack in the grain of the stone it will increase in size ramifying in all directions until at a certain point the stone will shiver blow up in fact the thing may happen in ten minutes it may not happen for months it will happen some time or other to a certainty any man who really knows something of diamonds will tell you that mr ruby had sunk back in his seat he seemed ill at ease but but can't we sell it to the duke it's the very stone he wants mr golden smiled we can sell it to the duke if it lasts long enough the attempt to cut it may bring about the smash i've known it happen before to-day we'll try at any rate we'll try you may be wrong golden i really think you may be i may be mr golden's tone was grim i'll have it put into hand at once it's a glorious stone one of the finest stones i've ever seen it would be a bargain to any one at at ten thousand pounds the other hello fangst brook unannounced mr brook had entered the room he had taken mr fangst unawares mr fangst stared at him amazed he was a paunchy little man with black curly well-greased hair which he parted in the middle uninvited his visitor took a chair i've only just reached paris left london this afternoon and came straight on here this is this is funny this is very funny indeed mr fangst said this instead of this and funny instead of funny is is it anything you have come to see about only you my fangst only you the two friends looked at each other mr brooke's lips were parted by a smile there was a curious look in mr fangst's eyes he seemed rather ill at ease that is very funny do you know i was putting a few things together to come over to london to-night to have a little talk with you what was to be the purport of the talk my fangst it was only about a little thing it was just a word i wished to say to you about mr fangst glanced at the floor then up again about the diamond the diamond mr brooke's smile grew more pronounced just a little talk it's sold sold what the diamond a singular change took place in mr fangst's appearance his jaw dropped his eyes seemed to increase in size his paunchy frame seemed to quiver under emotion i found a customer this morning what did you get for it twenty thirty thousand pounds mr brooke laughed outright <laughs> not quite so much as that not so much what did you get for it a thousand down a thousand down a thousand pounds mine got mr fungst's face was a picture he seemed divided between tears and rage oh harold brook what a fool you are not such a fool as i look my fungst the stone was a wrong un a wrong un what do you call a wrong un it was afflicted with the shivers cracked my boy it is more than probable that by now it is splintered into dust oh good heavens harold brooke what a fool you are mr fungst raised his two fat hands above his well-oiled head as if he were appealing to the skies it is more than a week ago since i saw in my own stone in the very heart of it a spot like a little speck of light it was only this morning that i observed the same phenomenon in mine i knew from painful experience what it meant you knew what it meant you thought you knew what it meant as a matter of fact you knew nothing at all about it any more than me when i see this little spot i say to myself it is all over you are done for 
bang goes your little pile i have seen stones begin like that and pulverize within a quarter of an hour twenty minutes it is a mystery which no man understands not even the man who thinks he knows the most i was fit to tear my hair i rushed off in a cab determined to sell the stone at any price if i could only be in time you know how they used to do that sort of thing at kimberley as i was in the cab i kept looking at my stone through my spyglass to see how it was getting on my heart was fit to break all of a sudden i see something which i had never seen before the little spot of white light had turned into a little spot of colour it was as though a little spot of blood had gotten into the very centre of the stone i say to myself it is certain that if i try to sell the stone just as it is i shall get nothing for it scarcely anything at all about this affair there is something which i do not understand there is no man living who understands all the ins and outs of diamonds no chemist no scientist i care not who it is there are mysteries about diamonds which never yet have been explained i have known some of them within the range of my own experience so i say to myself there is a mystery in this if i sell the diamond now a loss is certain if i see the mystery through the loss is problematical i will see the mystery through i came back home again i put the diamond away i did not look at it for two whole days when after two whole days i came to open the little box in which i had placed the diamond i scarcely dared to open the lid i felt that as you say my heart was in my boots i felt as though my heart was made of jelly and that it was melting all away mr fungst paused he raised his fat forefinger he pointed it at mr brooke i say to myself have courage then i take a little nip of brandy that give me strength then i have a smoke then i raise the lid mr fungst raised himself on tiptoe he seemed to increase in size my friend there was the diamond but what a diamond it was a rose brilliant but such a rose brilliant as the world has never seen mr brooke laughed a little awkwardly <laughs> i say fungst aren't you piling it on am i piling it on you shall see for yourself if i am piling it on mr fungst took a little leather bag out of an inner pocket of his coat he handed it to mr brooke open it and see if i am piling it on mr brooke untied the cord which bound the neck of the bag within nestled a diamond a rose brilliant but of such a hue red as a rose was not exactly she but it mr brooke feasted his eyes upon its beauties the stone was still uncut its greatest beauties were therefore still unrevealed but even in its rough state it was a masterpiece of light and colour what a stone mr fungst stood in front of his friend he rubbed his hands together he sprang from foot to foot do i pile it on but i say fungst this seems to me very like a miracle i can scarcely credit that such a stone as this was only the other day a pure white diamond with something which looked very like a crack in it i tell you there are mysteries in diamonds which no man understands not any one what are you going to do with it that is just the point on which i wish to speak to you you know j f flinders the american millionaire billionaire he must be rather because they say his income is nearly a million yearly he is in paris his daughter is going to be married he is looking for a wedding present for her something a little out of the common i went to him i show him this i tell him i think i know where there is another like it he offered me for the pair for the pair you understand mr fungst leaned over he whispered in his friend's ear you don't mean it to a centim that is what he offered mr brooke whistled Whew. 
and i sold it for a thousand pounds to whom did you sell it to a man named tyrrell mr brooke had risen from his seat he began to walk about the room tyrrell of clerkenwell the same then after all to-night i must go to london it is for me to buy it back again for you mr brooke faced round it strikes me fungst that it's for me to buy it back again very good my friend but it is possible that mr tyrrell may know more about diamonds than you he will want more than his thousand pounds mr brooke bit his lip he knows me he will give me credit as to that we shall see mr fungst began to cram some things into a gladstone bag mr brooke watched him for some moments then he went and touched him on the shoulder look here fungst what are you driving at what do you think you're going to do mr fungst turned to his friend all frankness all i wish is that we should have the pair just you and i mr brooke retained his grasp upon his friend's shoulder nor did he remove his inquisitorial glance from his friend's frank features yes just you with the fingers of his disengaged hand mr brooke tapped himself on the chest and i the two my friend could you tell me just one thing ivor decker glanced down at the speaker he was a little rotund fellow he spoke with a strong foreign accent on his features there was the impress of the german jew and not by any means of the highest type of german jew he looked oddly out of place in the midst of that gorgeous assemblage built rather for the purlieus of houndsditch than for the marquis of clonkilty's ballroom mr decker could scarcely believe that the profusely perspiring little man addressed himself to him but mr fungst removed all misapprehension on that score by twitching mr decker by the lapel of his coat he repeated his inquiry my friend could you tell me just one thing if it is in my power could you tell me which is the duchess of datchet the duchess of datchet ivor decker smiled outright the idea of there being any possible association between that oily houndstitch hebrew and the latest and brightest queen of the london season the bride of but a month or two struck him as too ludicrous mr decker was possessed of that rare attribute a sense of humour a wicked idea entered his head are you a friend of her graces i am not a friend exactly but there is a little business which i wish to do with her a little business in the marquis of clonkilty's ballroom with the queen of hearts mr decker's eyes wandered round the room they passed from dancer to dancer at last they rested upon one as they did so he raised his hand to his moustache possibly to conceal the smile which he could not restrain you see that lady over there there are so many ladies upon my soul i never see so many ladies the lady in the dark green dress with the nose glasses the old girl with the moustache precisely the old girl with the moustache mr decker's smile almost expanded into a grin that is the duchess of datchet without a word of thanks mr fungs strode off he ploughed his way through the dancers without paying the slightest regard to the evolutions they were attempting to perform mr decker watched him go with a degree of delight which seemed on the point of producing an inward convulsion all at once mr fungs pulled up right in front of a couple they both were young who seemed in blissful enjoyment of the waltz she hasn't got it on so help me sir the young gentleman whose path he had impeded addressed him with a degree of scorn which was intended to be crushing mr fungst was not at all abashed i wasn't speaking to you my friend then to himself still audibly mein gott if she has lost it striding forward he caught a lady by the arm she had on a dark green dress she wore a pair of nose-glasses 
more than the suggestion of a moustache adorned her upper lip she was beginning to be stricken in years but that did not prevent her waltzing with apparent enjoyment with a gentleman who seemed at least ten years her junior she and her partner were still moving to the rhythm of the music when mr fungst caught her by the arm excuse me my name is fungst jacob fungst there is a little word i wish to speak to you just now the lady stopped startled she turned when her glance fell on mr fungst it had to fall some distance she drew herself up and shuddered as though she had come into sudden contact with an iceberg who is this person fungst explained the owner of that name there is just a little thing about which i wish to speak to you two words outside the lady addressed her cavalier will you please take me away this person is a stranger to me he took her away as mr fungst continued to stare after the retreating pair someone touched him on the shoulder it was a young gentleman who wore a single eyeglass it is not impossible that he had been commissioned by mr ivor decker who is the soul of mischief don't you think you're rather blocking the way what is it you want i wish to say just two words to the duchess of datchet that is not the duchess of datchet the young gentleman drew him aside that is the duchess of datchet as he spoke the music ceased the dance was ended the gentlemen began to lead the ladies to their seats in front of mr fungst there passed a woman who was tall and most divinely fair her hair was of the colour of the rich red gold where its glorious mass was thickest there gleamed the diamond it was the diamond and not the woman which caught the eye of mr fungst mein gott he uttered what seemed to be his favourite imprecation it's changed something seemed to startle him so greatly that he actually allowed the lady to pass and unmolested she leaned on the arm of a gentleman who was not only much taller than herself but in his way as handsome there was probably no handsomer couple in the room and yet the lady seemed ill at ease although the gentleman was smiling at her all the time that was the duchess of datchet observed mr fungst's new acquaintance who had been observing him with unconcealed amusement mr fungst awoke as though from a stupor again there came that adjuration mein gott she's gone she was and before mr fungst caught sight of her again the duchess of datchet's carriage had been called and her grace was in it driving from the ball the duchess had the carriage to herself a gentleman had escorted her to the door as he closed it he murmured just one word remember she leaning forward had replied do you think i can forget as the vehicle passed swiftly through the night if one might judge from the expression on her countenance it did not seem as though she could once she put up her small gloved hands and veiled her face veiled it though there was no one there to see she took a little card from the bosom of her dress it was the programme of the ball it was a white card the back was blank or rather it would have been if it had not been for certain pencil marks the pencil marks were figures on the back of the programme was a little sum in compound addition it was cast up the total was stated the sight of that total seemed to cause her grace discomfort if i could only lay my hand upon the money the carriage reached home as the duchess entered the hall a servant advanced to meet her he addressed the lady in a confidential whisper the gentleman wishes to see your grace he has been waiting more than an hour the duchess shivered she drew her cloak closer round her possibly she felt the air a trifle cold has the duke returned not yet your grace show the gentleman into my sitting-room she did not ask the visitor's name but when she was alone in her own apartment she veiled her face with her hands again only for a moment when the door opened all traces of agitation had disappeared there entered a young and comely man who although he was dressed in rough and ready morning costume looked as though he were a man of breeding at sight of him the duchess started it almost seemed as if he were not at all the sort of person she had expected to see she waited for the visitor to speak 
this the visitor appeared to experience some little difficulty in doing i must crave your grace's forgiveness for my intrusion at this unseasonable hour but circumstances of a peculiar nature he paused in his turn he started his eyes were fixed upon the duchess's head upon the glory of her hair he gave an exclamation of surprise it's changed fangst was right sir the duchess drew back she appeared to find the stranger's demeanour slightly singular as well she might he continued staring at her as though he could not take his eyes away he was all at once possessed with a strange excitement your grace must forgive me if the offer i am about to make to you seems strange as it cannot help but seem if you knew all i am sure you would forgive me i will give you ten thousand pounds for the diamond in your hair you will give me ten thousand pounds for the diamond in my hair half mechanically the lady raised her hand to her head her fingers lighted on the jewel which gleamed among her tresses as they did so and some faint comprehension of the stranger's meaning dawned upon her mind her face became a crimson red my husband's present are you a madman sir or do you purposely insult me that diamond was mine on its possession i had founded all my hopes of fortune it was taken from me by means of a trick perhaps mr brooke thought he spoke the truth one can but hope he did i received for it not a twentieth part of the sum i offer you again he slightly erred but rather than it should be lost to me for ever poor as i am i will give you i will give you twelve thousand pounds twelve thousand pounds her grace's hand was lifted to her corsage possibly it brushed against the ball programme with the compound addition sum upon its back which lay within you will give me twelve thousand pounds she drew a deep breath but but it's absurd who are you sir that you forget who i am what does it matter who i am i am harold brooke i am the modern equivalent of the soldier of fortune and you have my fortune my fortune in your hair twelve did i say i'd give for my fortune back again i'll give you fifteen thousand pounds fifteen thousand pounds her grace's hands veiled her grace's face again am i going mad fifteen thousand pounds she sat down her agitation seemed extraordinary she was positively trembling it is not to be thought of i will give you twenty 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 thousand pounds there was silence mr brooke leaned forward looking down at her she looked up at him with her right hand she grasped the upper portion of her corsage this time there was no mistake about it between her fingers she pressed that program of the ball her face became cold and set she became all at once a little older the character of her beauty seemed to change it was stern and hard your behaviour is that of a madman i am scarcely less mad than you or i should not continue to listen how am i to know that you are not as you very probably are trifling with me all the time promise me that the diamond shall be mine if i bring you the money in the morning twenty thousand pounds twenty thousand pounds twenty i will give you thirty the voice said dirty mr brooke sprang round her grace stood up a little man almost as broad as he was tall was standing at the open door entering he closed the door behind him fangst so brooke he said you thought to do me but i am not done so easily my friend how did you get here that is my secret there are more ways than one of getting into the duke of datchet's house my friend the two men stood staring at each other mr brooke with clenched fists and a flush upon his face mr fungst with his crush hat under his arm his hands in his overcoat pockets 
and an ungenial smile upon his lips as for the duchess she stood staring at them both the march of events seemed to have deprived her of a little of her breath when she did speak she addressed herself to mr fungst may i ask sir what is the meaning of this intrusion and who you are i am jacob fungst that's who i am if it was not for me he would not have had the stone at all and when he make a fool of himself and sell it if it was not for me he would not have known what it was that he had sold now when i have found a market for the stone he tries to do me his friend his very good friend indeed out of the market i have found that is why when he say twenty thousand i say thirty and not in the morning but cash down fangst i advise you to be careful i will be careful be easy in your mind i will be careful it is a thing of which i am very fond carefulness mr brooke touched his friend lightly on the shoulder i only seek my share of the spoil your share very good get what share you please it is the same to me it is your behind the door ways i do not like mr fungst turned to the duchess he stretched out his hand i have been running after that diamond all through the town yes night and day from the pillar to the post i trace it home to you i learn that it was presented to you this morning to wear to-night at the marquis of clonkilty's ball at the marquis of clonkilty's ball i see it in your hair her grace's bewilderment seemed to be increasing the marquis of clonkilty's ball you yes me i go to the door of the house i ask for you there was a crowd of people they do not seem to understand they say what name i say fungst they show me up the stairs i find myself in the middle of the ball i say to myself this is funny since i am here well i will look for the stone i look for the stone i see it in your hair the sight so surprises me i lose my head when i find it i find you gone i come after you i come here it take me some time and a little diplomacy mr fungst patted his waistcoat pocket to get into the house it was more trouble a great deal more trouble than to get into the marquis of clonkilty's ball but when i do get in i offer you for the diamond money down thirty thousand pounds again mr brooke touched his friend upon the shoulder fungst you will have to reckon with me i will reckon with you never fear i will tell the lady why i offer for the diamond thirty thousand pounds it is a great price a very great price to offer for one diamond it is because i have the other stone just like it and i wish to make a pair i will show the other stone to the lady she will see i tell the truth mr fungst began groping in the inner pocket of his coat he produced a little leather bag it is in this bag he was holding the bag between the fingers of his right hand suddenly a curious expression began to creep over his features it is very funny he hesitated it is in this bag he began to untie the cord which bound the neck of the bag in the midst of the operation he paused he felt the contents of the bag with the fingers of either hand it is it is very funny his face assumed a curious leaden hue it is in this bag mr brooke advanced what's the matter fungst it it is nothing it it is very funny the stone is in this bag he continued to untie the cord it was all untied with peculiar circumspection he opened the neck of the bag he peeped within he continued to peep within as if to explore its depths were a work of time he staggered backwards mein gott it's gone i'm robbed robbed cried mr brooke he took the bag out of mr fungst's unresisting hand there was a strange expression on his face there was a curious glitter in his eyes as he peeped into the bag he laughed not pleasantly <laughs> not robbed my fungst not robbed the diamond's here 
he turned the bag upside down upon the table there came out a little mass of tiny sparkling crystals they formed upon the table a small heap of glittering dust mr brooke pointed to it with his hand there's your rose brilliant fungst <laughs> mr fungst came forward he leaned over the table he stared at the gleaming atoms mein gott it's gone off bang as you say my fungst it has gone off bang who was right my fungst personally i never knew a diamond which when attacked by the shivers sooner or later did not go off bang i am inclined to wager that even the duchess of datchet's beautiful rose brilliant will go off bang her grace stared she had been a mystified spectator of the little scene which had been enacted before her eyes indeed the whole proceedings were mysterious to her rose brilliant what do you mean the rose brilliant in your grace's hair there is no rose brilliant in my hair there is only the diamond which my husband gave me did not his grace present you with a rose brilliant a rose brilliant no he gave me a white diamond then the transformation has happened since transformation what do you mean she took the jewel out of her hair as her glance fell upon it the fashion of her countenance changed she scarcely seemed to believe the evidence of her own eyes this this is not my diamond mr brooke's laughing eyes were divided between her grace and her grace's jewel i think it is but mine was white and this is red mr fungst's glance was fixed upon the jewel gloating on its beauties so mine was white then it went red now it has gone off bang oh the lovely stone mr brooke laughed softly i am afraid that your grace must permit me to withdraw my offer of twenty thousand pounds or even of ten the diamond beautiful though it is belongs to a rather more speculative class of goods than i quite care to dabble in the duchess still held the jewel in her hand she had never for a moment removed her glance from it it seemed to exercise upon her gaze a sort of fascination it's alive alive mr brooke came nearer mr fungst craned forward they were a curious trio the duchess's tones were low and eager something seems to be moving within so there does in mr brooke's voice there was a sound as of laughter it's changing colour mr fungst spoke almost with a gasp forever look out mr brooke spoke just in time there was a little crack the diamond had disappeared three pairs of eyes were still bent upon her grace's hand but it was empty the diamond had gone it's gone off bang what do you mean exclaimed the duchess what has happened when your servants sweep the room in the morning your grace should give them instructions to be careful a diamond which was your husband's present and for which your grace was offered thirty thousand pounds lies in dust upon the floor with his hand mr fungst scraped the perspiration from his brow mein gott it's gone off bang he said